Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Atlantic Council. Welcome to the Future of Iran Initiative. I'm Barbara Slavin. I direct the Future of Iran Initiative. And we have a real treat for you today. Um, now, as everyone on this call knows, uh, Iran is no stranger to challenges and it's faced sanctions, war, and international isolation for much of its 41 year history as the Islamic Republic. But I think it's fair to say that in the last two years, uh, it has faced extraordinary challenges and the last few months have been particularly hard. Behind, uh, beyond its own inefficiencies and corruption, Iran has had to contend with a deadly virus. And of course, the US sanctions, which have hit really hard and have essentially collapsed its oil exports. Uh, according to the World Bank, Iran's economy will shrink this year by 5.3% after losses of 8.2% and 4.7% uh, respectively in the last two years. Uh, the World Bank predicts a slight improvement to return to growth, 2.1% growth next year. Uh, but the currency is at a record low, 200,000 rials to the dollar, and uh, the challenges continue. So we thought this would be a great time to assemble some of the foremost experts on the Iranian economy to talk about how bad it is, uh, and what, if anything, can be done to, to make it better. Um, we're really pleased to have uh, three speakers who are good friends of, of the Atlantic Council and very knowledgeable. We're going to start with uh, Nadere Shamlu. Uh, Nadere is an international development advisor and a former senior advisor to the chief economist of the Middle East and North Africa region at the World Bank, where she spent more than three decades. Nadere will, will speak first. Then uh, all the way from, uh, from Stockholm, uh, Mohsen Tavakol is an international business executive uh, and also a non-resident senior fellow with the Middle East programs here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, Mohsen worked for the Swedish telecoms giant Ericsson for 23 years, including in Iran and other challenging countries. And then last but not least, we have Kevin Harris, who's an assistant professor of sociology at the University of California, Los Angeles. He's the author of an excellent book, uh, A Social Revolution, Politics and the Welfare State in Iran. And he's the lead res researcher uh, for something called the Iran Social Survey, which is a nationwide survey of social and economic life under the Islamic Republic. Uh, we have just an hour, so I'm gonna ask the speakers to be brief so we leave lots of time for what I'm sure will be really excellent questions. So we're going to begin uh, with Nadere. Um, would you uh, give us a sort of overview of uh, where the economy stands? Um, and uh, if you would also then uh, move to talk about a very interesting blog post that you've written for us on what uh, makes Iranians happy or unhappy. So Nadere, the, the floor is yours. Well, Thank you so much. And uh, first and foremost, thank you, uh, Barbara, for inviting me. And it's uh, my pleasure to be here and a panelist among all these other uh, really first rate experts. Um, where, where does the Iranian economy uh, stand? First of all, like many other countries in the world, I Iran is not an exception in terms of the shocks that it has had to, um, to essentially uh, uh, with, withstand with respect to the both the health aspects of the corona um, virus as well as the fiscal impact of the coronavirus. After all, people are not working. Uh, there is no uh, you know production, uh, no no taxes, and at the same time, the the government has to go into a greater expenditure mode, by, both in terms of health as well as. Uh, supporting um, uh, supporting families that need uh, to be uh, you know kind of essentially kept uh, kept up to date. Um, oil prices have been, of course, as you know, um, sh uh, sinking uh, to unprecedented levels, um, and export markets uh, have been shrinking. But not not only in terms of just generally, you know, tourism is low, uh, exports are low, but Iran also faced at the very, very early stage uh, some uh, physical barriers because many of the countries, since it was one of the first countries to have been a, a hotspot for the, for the virus, many countries closed their borders. And of course, as a result, exports could not uh, be transported. 
add on top of everything else, so most countries have dealt with these three or four uh, four um, kinds of uh, uh, challenges. And on top of that, Iran has had to deal with the sanctions. Now, in terms of the um, just just in terms of uh, dealing with the crisis up to today, according to the um, to the statistics or to the to the numbers, about ten thousand people have died. Unfortunately, ten point three. Uh, uh, have died, and about uh, 217,000 uh, have been diagnosed with uh, with uh, with uh, COVID. And it's uh, there are Iran has gone now to the to the next stage in the sense that the the and there are new hotspots, as is as is the case also in the United States, new hotspots that now pose serious problems and serious challenges to the government. Uh, I think I just want to maybe use a few moments about. Uh, about the economy by focusing on the exchange rate and why it has uh, or why it has not uh, uh, performed as, as expected. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say that um, uh, my my information is based on sources in I mean like just public resources sources inside the inside Iran because I feel that in many ways um, what you read in the newspapers and so on uh, do determine market mood and market psychology and how people make um, make their uh, everyday decisions on that basis on the basis of the of what they read what they hear what they what they see others do so um, Iran and um, the the real past or the two month past a very very important psychological barrier of the of 20 thousand two man and there are several factors that uh, are worth mentioning one factor is of course that in in uh, late uh, uh, in in the first quarter of 2020 iran was moved back to the fatf blacklist and that of course caused some market uh, jitters in the sense that people knew that if it wasn't already difficult to uh, to move or to tra transfer or transact in foreign exchange, this the FATF decision was going to be even more uh, problematic. As a result, and as a result of this, as well as other factors, many of the Iranian export exported um, dollars or you know foreign exchange didn't make it back to the country according to the central bank of iran about 70 they were iran uh, earned about 72 um, billion dollars in non-oil exports and only 45 billion of those um, came back so there's a, a, a substantial um, share that is outside the country and that needs to be repatriated in addition to that, there were some uh, hiccups in the Iran uh, dirham uh, market. The, some traders weren't able to fulfill their uh, their obligations, and as you know, dirham is uh, is identically pegged to the dollar, and therefore the um, th those hiccups kind of found uh, found their way also into the dollar market. Uh, other factors is that there were also uh, some pent up demand uh, for 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 an exchange. People had, could not travel. People could not um, transact. Uh, businesses were closed for three months. So therefore, as a result of that opening of the of the uh, opening, there was suddenly a a, a huge um, you know a huge uh, or a relatively large demand that came to the market. And uh, the last part that I would like to to mention is that there were actually quite a lot of short sellers. Uh, thinking that the Iran-U.S. relations with, you know, the, the uh, exchange of prisoners, with, you know, the uh, the United States letting these uh, these uh, ships, Iranian ships, go to Venezuela, and so that it would there would be a thawing, and you know, President Trump sent several. Uh, uh, I would say very strong uh, messages or signals. So there was some uh, there were some people that thought actually, well, maybe maybe. There will be uh, there will be some uh, changes, but unfortunately, they had to rush back and fulfill uh, or at least f uh, uh, settle their short positions, and that again created a big demand for the market, and that led the, the central bank to uh, some uh, new and important uh, policies that I think are worth mentioning. As you know, everywhere in the world, central banks are easing; uh, they are easing in terms of uh, just 
pumping liquidity into the market, reducing interest rates and everything. In Iran, unfortunately, uh, the central bank has had to do the reverse by, by uh, tightening money uh, in, order, uh, in order to bring back these uh, you know, footloose dollars that Iranian exporters are keeping outside the country. Uh, they have uh, tried to signal to the market that they will manage. Uh, in, in essence, they are, the central bank is trying to uh, to target in, uh, inflation rate rather than the interest rate, so they, they will they will they are likely to let the uh, the exchange rate um, depreciate further, but they want to manage it. They want to manage uh, to make sure that there are not not so many fluctuations that could again feed the speculative. Um, uh, forces in the market and you know kind of create too much uh, unnecessary um, headache for exporters as well as importers as well as the do domestic and uh, export industry so they uh, they raise the interest rate uh, that uh, banks can get from the central bank when they deposit it at the central bank from 10% to 2 12% so as a result they are trying to make it more attractive for repatriation of, uh, of uh, reals and of course for the banks to attract them and, and, and bring, uh, instead of these things feeding into the stock market, into the real estate market or gold market, they want to actually bring it back into the banking sector. They also sold considerable amount of uh, domestic paper in order again to drain liquidity from, this, uh, from the system and to be able to um, rein in the inflation. So what I want to say is that these factors again as as uh, as we have seen in europe in in all the other countries while the governments in in many of these countries are able to essentially let uh, you know open the purse and let everything go uh, you know to to people in in iran unfortunately the government has had to do some contractionary uh, economic policies that probably will have will impact uh, growth as well as uh, you know uh, uh, poverty reduction as well as many other uh, key economic and you know job creation is another one and it would probably be uh, be um, you know a little bit tougher times coming up in the post covid circumstances than what we have uh, faced before so i will close here and happy to answer any further questions thank you uh, that's a great that's a great overview and that's exactly what uh, i appreciate we'll uh, we'll get back to the happiness index in, in a little bit but i wanted to turn now to mosan uh, who can drill down a little bit more on the specific problems that uh, private companies are facing. Uh, I was on a, a call earlier this week with some uh, folks who suggested that, that private companies were actually benefiting somehow because of this, because the government uh, was having trouble, uh, state-owned companies were having trouble, but that's, that's not been my impression. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mosin, also let me recommend to our viewers a very good blog post that, that uh, Mosin wrote about this topic of uh, yeah. private enterprise in the economy. All right, thank you very much, Barbara, for uh, the opportunity for being here. Uh, well, uh, I'm not going to crunch too much of numbers here because of the fact that numbers in Iran are not reliable. Uh, depending on who you are talking to and their agenda, uh, the numbers are manipulated and also we have, as it was mentioned earlier, different exchange rates types, not only the fluctuations, but the types that makes the numbers to be translated differently when you talk about dollars or euro, etc. Nonetheless, I can give <coughs> sorry, a quick um, pulse of the business in Iran and the private sector uh, by give some statistics anyway. Um, the government, the parliament actually made a report uh, earlier in March talking about <clears throat> the estimation they made about how the business in Iran is going to be impacted by the, by the pandemic. And they were estimating that about 1,000 1, to 4,000 people are going to pass away <clears throat> and about 100,000 to 200,000 people are going to be unemployed which will only have an impact of 50 to 124 million dollars. I mean, I'm rounding out the numbers on the country's pension fund. Of course, that was underestimated. And later on, they talk about with a new, in their new report that people between three to six and a half million people are gonna lose the jobs. 
and the inflation rate is going to be about 20, 20%, and the GDP is going to fall down to approximately 11%, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> IMF, of course, has a different view. They see these numbers to become worse, for example, minus 6% in the fall of the GDP. The point I'm trying to make here is that the government's involvement to recover the businesses and the private sector in Iran uh, is not going to be as strong as, as they <clears throat> try to give as a propaganda. President Rouhani, he announced about five million euros, sorry, five million dollars that was supposed to be get into the private businesses to help the businesses to recover. Uh, but they're going to give this as a loan, two years loan, about eight hundred to one thousand dollar per head per employee to each to each business, and with the with an interest rate of twelve percent. Why? At the same time, the National uh, Innovation Fund is talking about giving loan to some knowledge base and uh, startups with an with a interest rate of 9%, but they cannot say how much money, how much the funds are going to be uh, allocated. Nonetheless, for the interest of the short time, of course, I will be happy to, 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 to discuss and to answer questions. But I want just to conclude here very quickly. The private sector in Iran <clears throat> has not been really supported by the state during the past four decades, but they have been able to recover during the time of crisis, crisis after crisis after crisis. Uh, there are two factors, major factors impacting the private business in Iran. One is the external one that is basically the sanctions that are killing the businesses unfairly. And the other one is the internal one, which it comes to bureaucracy, incompetence, corruption of the government. So hand in hand, these two have been killing basically and destroying the Iranian private sector and the businesses. But still, I personally believe that the private sector in Iran can recover even after the pandemics. <clears throat> I do not agree with all due respect with many of my colleagues who believe that it's going to thrive, it's going to be even better and bigger and more beautiful. I don't think so. Uh, but I still believe that they can recover based on a number of factors. Okay. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Um, I want to uh, tell people, by the way, to put into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen the questions that you have. Uh, as they occur to you while the speakers are speaking. There was one already, which I think Mohsen answered very well, which is that it's very hard to rely on the statistics that come from the Iranian government. Uh, I think the, the COVID deaths is a, is a perfect example. There are suggestions, I think BBC Persian did, did a study <laughs> suggesting that the, the number of deaths uh, and cases may be five times higher than what the government has acknowledged. Um, so we, we, should, uh, we should bear that in mind. One question I have, and I, I don't know if, Kivan, if you have an answer to this, is, is the, the extent of the reserves that Iran has in uh, its national development fund, which used to be topped up with oil revenues. We know that oil revenues were only about $8 billion last year, which is a record low. Uh, but in general, fill us in on what are the social safety nets. We, there are some loans we hear now from Mosin for businesses and so on. What are the social safety nets? Are they holding up? Uh, how are uh, particularly poor Iranians getting through uh, this time? Thanks. Thank you, Barbara. Um, is the camera on me? Yes, it is. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. So. Um, these are all important questions. Thanks for everybody for tuning in. And first I wanted to step back and give a kind of big uh, uh, picture you know, of, of, of the kind of grand shift in, in the Iranian economy in, in, the, in, the, you know, in the current generation. I mean, for those of us who were living in Iran in previous years, um, you know, from the early 2000s all the way till about 2011, 2012, you know, there was a kind of general period of, of economic growth. Um, income per capita went up uh, quite a bit. Uh, so for about a decade, if not a little bit longer, there was a general experience in the Iranian society uh, of growth, even though it might not always been uh, perceived as such, but living standards went up. Um, uh, and then, you know, after 
2011-2012 with, of course, the first uptick in U.S.-led sanctions under the Obama administration, all the way to the present uh, with the more recent, you know, reinstallation and, and, and additional sanctions of, of Trump administration. You know, what can make the argument that Iran has experienced a kind of lost decade, the, the term that we use in development to refer to, you know, Latin America in the 1980s, for example. Uh, not just the lost decade in terms of economic stagnation, but really decline um, in, uh, you know, in basic income per capita measures. And now, of course, a lot of some of that is oil. So even in non-oil sectors, we've seen, uh, as most of them was saying, you know, um, either stagnation or crisis in some areas. Many people make the case that that's taken up the slack of the oil sector. And, you know, for perverse or maybe unintended reasons, over the last decade, the non-oil versus oil sectors have shifted in Iran. So non-oil sectors in Iran uh, are, you know, relatively larger compared to 10 years ago. Some of that is just numbers. Some of that is the shift in the Iran economy under a decade of sanctions uh, and attempted isolation by, by the United States. So depending on the measurements, you know, um, you know, uh, I know that the Parliament Research Center noted that Arguably, purchasing power for Iranians has gone down by about a third over the last decade. And this is, you know, when people are experiencing this, this is the kind of frame that they use when they're, uh, you know, expressing their grievances about their economic situation. So that's the big picture in terms of growth uh, and decline um, in, in Iran. The, the, the government response to, you know, um, the, the global depression uh, of 2020 uh, and the coronavirus pandemic really depend, you know, the way that it's being read uh, both inside and, and outside of Iran really depends on everyone's pet theory. So everyone has a pet theory of what's the most important set of institutions in Iran. Some people argue that, oh, this is a play, this is a um, space where, you know, the military institutions have been stepping in. Uh, and of course, they're very eager to, you know, sell propaganda about how important they are, how much they're helping the people, you know, how internally they've been uh, applying their kind of mobilizational drives to, to give aid uh, to the, uh, the depressed regions of the country. Of course, a lot of that is just PR, and we shouldn't just report this as news because, you know, there's tons of media organizations in Iran that pump this stuff out. It's actually very difficult to assess the importance of, of these activities. Another group of uh, intellectuals and journalists and activists claim that, uh, oh, it's really the it's civil society in Iran, it's the non-state sectors that are bearing the burden and shouldering uh, the weight of the response to uh, the pandemic uh, and increased health burdens of society. Um, that's also, I would think, a bit of cheerleading that, you know, we've always stressed, you know, civil society and non-state actors in Iran as being very important. but. You know, public health crisis uh, is emphasizes the public side of things. So I, I tend to believe that that's a bit over exaggerated as well. And then the third is, you know, the government itself uh, has, you know, a legacy of public health institutions. They're fragmented. Uh, I have a chapter in my book I wrote about uh, this um, before all of this happened. Uh, and we have seen that although fragmented, you know, the, these public health institutions, both directly run by the government as well as connected to other parts uh, of the public sector have, have you know, have absorbed um, a lot of the illness burden uh, across the country with some coordination across you know, different hospital systems and, and public health monitoring systems. Um, it's very difficult to assess still, even inside of Iran, you know, what part of the government society have, have done the most to deal with uh, the, the you know, health burdens related to COVID-19. But, you know, like in many countries, um, although there's been a, a monetary tightening, as, as Dr. Shamu pointed out, there is a stimulus package from the government. Um, these, uh, you know, it's a kind of a shotgun blast. It's not too different in many ways than the United States uh, in the sense of there's about a $4 billion program to provide loans to small businesses, trying to keep employment at least somewhat um, connected to uh, keeping businesses open, loans to households. There's been some additional transfer payments to uh, lower income households and, you know, a nominal increase in, for example, pension payments, but it's nominal. It's not going to keep up with the inflation rate. So this is a buffer, but it's not a buffer that's going to prevent the decline in living standards. And, you know, as we've seen 
in the news reported inside of Iran and, and now outside that, you know, arguably Iran is going through a second wave earlier than most expected. But this wave, like, you know, most, like the United States, is unevenly distributed. Of course, it's a far lower order of magnitude in Iran than the United States, even if the caseload is higher than reported. And there's been some serological testing done which means they've been testing for you know, past uh, incidences of COVID in Iran. And some recent public health officials in Iran have stated that maybe about 20% of Om has, uh, has been infected at some point over the past, uh, over the past six months. Maybe 10% of Tehran has been exposed. Uh, so you know, some of the public health officials um, in state institutions are saying that about maybe 15 million Iranians uh, have been exposed. That's still, you know, far lower than 50% of the population. And this new uptick in cases that, you know, no one can hide in Iran are occurring in the border provinces as well as some of the urban centers. Um, so these are very difficult to control. And, you know, the big question is, can this kind of fragmented and uneven health system absorb these individuals, especially as, just like in the United States, there is social distance fatigue going on in Iran. And, you know, state officials are saying that uh, the, the actually rather impressive attention to public health behaviors and social distancing and mask wearing, which was going on in March and April and May, is declining. Um, and so, you know, you can go on the Tehran subway, people seem to still be wearing masks on the subway, but in small businesses and, the you know, the bazaar, it's, it's hard to police these, uh, these behaviors. So the good news is that Iran is a relatively young population, not as young as it used to be, but the median age in Iran is about 31. In Italy, the median age is 47. So some of the disease burden, uh, as we see, you know, there might be people getting sick, but less, less death rates. Some of it might be related to demographics. Also, it seems that while in the beginning, like in a lot of countries, um, you know, there was a lot of unknowns and how to handle uh, the coronavirus. Seems that, you know, uptick in screening, um, some isolation once uh, cases are discovered, uh, and then, you know, a, a general idea of what, what, what kind of treatments uh, can be used to at least lessen uh, mortality rates. These are, you know, pretty well known now around the Iranian public health care system. Um, but, uh, you know, what's coming out of, of the Rouhani government over the last few weeks is that this is the new normal and, you know, Iranians need to get used to this for at least the next year, if not the next two years. Okay, okay, that's excellent. The, the questions are piling in now. Um, and uh, I have a bunch that I think Nadere can answer. Uh, this one's rather specific. Um, why did the central bank reduce interest rates on savings uh, against the inflationary pressure on real? Wasn't it a way to make people transfer their savings into the stock market? as the government was looking to gain from selling ETFs and state-owned enterprises. Maybe that's for both you, uh, Nadere, and for, for Mohsen. Uh, and also, uh, first let's start with that, Nadere, and then we'll get to the happiness index, if we may. Okay, well, uh, uh, what, I'm, what I said is that actually the government, the central bank, uh, increased the rate at which it pays banks so it was it was not a reduction it was an increase in in the rate uh, uh, so maybe i was not clear about it before but uh, I, i'm just talking about the last i mean i don't want to get too much into the historical aspect but uh, i want to, to get in uh, just recently they increased it from t uh, 10% to tw uh, to 12% so that banks would be able to attract some of this liquidity and then of course deposit it with the central bank and that there this way reduce a little bit the speculative or you know sort of like this uh, because people don't have anywhere to put their money in so they put it into gold into uh, real estate into of course the stock market uh, and of course into uh, in to dollars. So what they want to do is to actually bring this back. Now, 
with uh, by doing so they not only bring back the the dollars but also with a uh, with a depreciation of the exchange rate they make iranian exports more attractive to let's say iraq and afghanistan or some of the countries that are around and the government is very very specific in trying to to penetrate these markets because these markets are not very much brand driven or uh, you know high quality driven so there's some things that these are some markets that iranian uh, producers can actually uh, uh, penetrate to yeah let's get to your happiness index before we go to this and you a really interesting uh, blog post which is up on uh, our iran source site uh, today and uh, it suggests that uh, that the happy that Iranians are a not very happy, uh, but that b the economy is not the main reason for it. Uh, tell us something about this, if you would. Yes, well, I just a, a quick uh, note. I was watching during this COVID uh, lockdown lots of Iranian movies uh, just by whatever uh, YouTube fed me. And what I found is that people were so ignitable and so irritable. And I talked to some of my friends. I said, "Is this really the the current Iranian, uh, you know, society? Is this pe how people talk to each other or react to each other?" And she said, "Yes, this is it. This the the art mimics life uh, very very correctly." Uh, some years ago, I looked at the ha World Happiness Report, uh, and you know. Um, the UN has published it from 2012 to 2020. So I said, let me look at the look at the trends and the the, the various um, components, because uh, the, this report uh, got started because um, there was this growing body of literature that said, you know, GDP growth is not uh, a sufficient uh, indicator of, of well-being. There are other factors, subjective uh, elements of, of well-being. So I said, and I had written a, a chapter for, uh, for, the, for the Oxford Handbook. So I said, let me look at these numbers and what, what, uh, what I find. And, and so let me quickly just uh, show the... Um, um, Zainab, if you could please put up... The, the a number five, please. So the the index looks at is is based on a, a about a thousand observations per country uh, from the Gallup poll, Gallup World poll, and it looks at uh, at various like you know, did you feel happy yesterday? Did you feel uh, do you feel uh, healthy? Are you um, you know in which category of of income category do you place yourself? Do you have uh, a freedom of making life choices? Do you, what do you, what is your feeling about corruption? What is your feeling about uh, social prote social protection or social support? What is your feeling about general? I mean, have you donated? Have you? Uh, so anyway, it goes into various um, uh, both subjective as well as some objective um, elements of uh, of well being, and uh, it brings together composite. Uh, uh, score so here in this figure that you see i have plotted the composite store uh, score of iran versus the three other my favorite three other comparator countries which is turkey uh, south korea and vietnam uh, and i explained why i did this because i wrote an earlier blog about that and what is interesting is that in the in the late 2010s like you know between 2005 and 2000 uh, 10 when the Gallup poll when this um, you know this information was uh, being made available Iran was in the same uh, what I would call sco uh, happiness score neighborhood at uh, than these countries and it has steadily gone down wow. and uh, so yeah. the other countries are um, doing better though not continuously sorry uh, um, Barbara you had a yeah, I, I could just interject. The one time you see it go up is after Rouhani is elected. Yes. yes. So that's a positive, kind of, it, it probably reflects a positive feeling of, you know, optimism and so on. And now, Zainab, if you could please uh, show uh, figures. Yeah, exactly. So then I went into the subcomponent, and you know the the score is then ranked by countries, and you know 157, sometimes 100, uh, you know 153. So what is interesting is that 
overall, Iran is not doing very well. Uh, the higher the score, the, the higher the ranking, the, the less happy. So Iran is 118 out of 157. So essentially, we're just below the unhappiest quintile of countries. Um, but then when you look at the subcomponents and how they are ranked with, with respect to these other countries, negative aspects, which negative effects, which, which mean essentially the, how people, how these respondents uh, um, reported um, feelings of anger, you know, uh, um, sadness and so on, ranks really high. So in other words, Iranian people are very, you know, emotionally feeling very sad. Uh, support systems were not in place, so again, they didn't feel very good about that. Um, and uh, freedom to make life choices was also rated quite, um, you know, in, in the sense of quite negatively. What is interesting is income. Uh, people, uh, they had to kind of, um, first of all, place themselves uh, in terms of income and then it was kind of normalized with respect to the genie of the household, genie of the person, the you know, income uh, index of the person. Um, but then in addition to that, they were asked, well, where, where do you rate yourself in, in, uh, in terms of happiest or, or lowest uh, happiness? And as you can see, uh, on the income uh, category, which is 54, Iran is actually doing quite well. So people are not only uh, unhappy about the economic impact. I think that what I came away with uh, in this analysis is that all the other negative impacts, all the other negative feelings magnify the feeling of uh, economic uh, um, difficulties, economic, bad economic circumstances. And a lot of people complain or at least associate those bad economic circumstances to sanctions. So uh, what is interesting is that um, the non-monetary um, elements or dimensions of, uh, of uh, happiness or well-being, personal well-being, that are essentially within the context or within the control of uh, Iranian government officials or Iranian government policies are doing far worse than income. But nonetheless, they, they impact the, the well-being, the overall well-being of, um, of the um, Oh, Thank you, and uh, I hope everybody will will read this this wonderful uh, this wonderful post. I want to get to more of our questions, Mosan. Uh, I want you uh, to uh, to talk a little bit about uh, about the stock market. Uh, I want you also um, to specifically ask, and this is a question from Faye Moktadar, a member of the Atlantic Council. What specific things uh, could be done? Uh, to help the private sector, uh, how big a role would, would sanctions relief play? Would the government be able to really benefit from sanctions relief to institute reforms? Uh, Nadre mentioned, for example, the decision on the, far, uh, the Financial Action Task Force, FATF, against adopting these uh, regulations that are supposed to control things like money laundering and terrorism financing. Would the government be able to embrace these, these kinds of measures? So. Um, what specifically uh, could the government uh, do? Thanks. How many hours do I have for answering all of these questions? Yeah, well, not, yeah. not so many. And uh, uh, I, I, I go very quickly. Give a start to so, that. <laughs> I mean, I would be happy to discuss this you know, offline with every of these visitors who are actually uh, are our guests. So no problem with that. Um, I look at the stock exchange first. I saw the, 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 the questions. And I'm sorry if I sound a little bit harsh. Uh, the exchange, the stock exchange in Iran has been always manipulated of two reasons. One is insider, the other one is misinformation. What has happened lately, and this is my personal opinion and experience, so you forgive me if I go against the, against the wave. What I see in the stock exchange in Iran is a bubble. Uh, we have recently a number of companies belonging to Shasta that belong to the investment company of the social security. And I happened when I was in Iran to actually look into many of those and they are almost bankrupt, many of them. Some of them today are laying off people, they are reducing the productivity and also they are incurring losses. But at the same time, you look into the stock market and you see that their share value goes up that doesn't make sense so that gives the impression that it is manipulated 
So some people may make money, of course, but I think in the long run it's going to burst. So that's a short version about that answer. Going to the discussion that, uh, or, or the question that Faye had about how the Iranian business private sector can, can recover, and I saw another actually question that relates to, to the prospect of reforms. Uh, I try to answer both. Uh, in my personal opinion, and being engaged in the private sector in Iran, there are, easy to, it's easy to say, but I still try to explain it for you. There are two ways for the private sector to actually recover in Iran. One is in the hands on the, of, of the Iranian government. They have to have financial and regulatory reforms. I'm trying to be a specific. When it comes to the financial reforms, uh, they have to have equal exchange rate management for all. Not have, you know, NEMA and you have, you know, the, the SAPA and then you have the floating rate and you have the government rate, etc. That's one reform. The other one is to simplify the tax system. Today, you are just going out and widely, you know, imposing tax to a number of companies, even though they are making losses, real losses. Also, uh, efficient utilization of different funds. Of course, uh, that goes to that question about the prospects of reforms. I mean, you have to stop corruption in order to be able to basically do these reforms. And then, the other one is regulatory reforms. What does it mean? It means that today you have a number of regulatory bodies that are working parallel and they are doing the same thing, handling the same thing. You know, one belongs to the Ministry of Intelligence, one belongs to the Ministry of Jud Judiciary, um, uh, the other one belongs to the Ministry of Islamic Guidance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have to also reform the regulatory bodies and let Iranian business do what it is good at. So I used to say to the friends and, and, and to, to, to colleagues, just let the private sector be. Don't get involved too much in it, you know? Because Iran is a capitalist society and you have to let the private business work like that. Um, but also for the recovery, you need to lift the sanctions. Now, I'm not naive by saying that, okay, tomorrow you just push the button and remove the sanctions. But sanctions are harming more the private sector in Iran and the normal people than the government and the statement. Because people cannot buy software, they cannot do the transactions, they cannot uh, import raw material, they cannot export services and goods. So removing the sanctions is going to help also the, the private sector and the businesses to recover. Okay. That answer all yeah, that's great. I think uh, the the issue of the um, exchange rate is so important. Uh, I mean, the the first time I went to Iran uh, in 1996, the official rate was 6,000 rials to the dollar, and the black market rate was 10,000 rials to the dollar. And I mean, it just gives so much opportunity for uh, for corruption and, and and manipulation when you have uh, in those days it was just two rates now I, you can't even keep track of how many different rates there are um, so so clearly that would be important um, I'm I'm going to um, go to uh, a question about instex also if Mosin, if you could answer this um, we know that it perf it's performed one transaction. I believe uh, there were some medical supplies that went to Iran, uh, but I don't think there's been anything no. since. Is it just, I mean, you did a blog post, as I recall, uh, uh, I it was a primarily political gesture. Do you still think that it has, does it have any use really? Yeah, uh, I saw that question as well coming from Germany actually. Uh, and in, in the question it is asked, what is the view in Iran? Well, I can tell you my view about it. Uh, even though there are colleagues right now actually logged into this call and listening to us, and I personally was involved when the mechanism was supposed to be defined, I look upon INSTEX as a political move, not a real mechanism that is supposed to work. And I give you a quickly a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, when, when the US walked away from GCPOA, EU or E3, France, UK, and Germany, they tried to buy time. They tried by, you know, bringing this instex thing up in order to buy time, hoping that Iran or the US or both are going to come back to the table. So it was not meant to work. I can prove that by saying that if you're looking at 
the people who were assigned to this from the European side, they were all the employees of the foreign office. None of them were bankers. None of them belonged to the Ministry of, of Finance. If you want to have a finance mechanism, you have to have financial people working on it. And then you look at the Iranian side, they assigned three, four people. None of them were highly qualified bankers. They were low level employees. That shows that Iran never believed in Instex. Hmm. Then Instex was supposed to help the European companies and the Iranian companies to do uh, the business. But immediately and suddenly it turned to humanitarian thing, medicine, et cetera, et cetera. That does not satisfy the Iranians. That does not satisfy the private sector in Iran because private sector has, despite all the regulations and all the problems in Iran, has always worked independent. Uh, <clears throat> Let me, let me stop you there, if I, if I may. I want to get to, I think, which is perhaps the, uh, the, the $24,000 question or $64,000 question, as we say. Maybe I'll throw this to you, Kevin, first. And, uh, you know, this maximum pressure campaign that the Trump administration has been maintaining on Iran, uh, you know, some uh, in the administration have suggested that it would, uh, it would cause the regime to, if it didn't come back to the table, to collapse. And so, hence, the regime would have to return to, to negotiations. Uh, Kevon or any of the others, do any of you see, um, see uh, that regime change is likely to come from these poor economic circumstances? Okay, well, I mean, that's, that's one possible scenario which has always floated in policy circles and maybe some utopian or dystopian circles, depending on your opinion. But the problem with that uh, scenario is that it's very hard to envision a a step-by-step -step path which um in which you know the the government which of course is is the main you know it's the main contributor to the economy in iran um collapses on its own but remember that you know there's not a single guy running the iranian government it's it's full of different uh factions that are linked to different power centers in iran and to enact a major policy shift in Iran, you know, um, consensus is usually required because there's so many veto points that can stop a process from going on. Look at the FATF negotiations, a classic example of Iranian veto politics occurring to stop something in which one segment of the political elite would like to accomplish. So I would like to flip the question on anybody who asked that, said, you know, what's the scenario in which there's a so-called collapse? And we have to remember that um, because of the relationship between Iran and the world economy uh, and, and great powers of the last 40 years, Iran has not really been financially dependent on uh, international financial institutions, right. external lenders, not to mention the United States. So there are you know, huge creditors in the global market that can, let's say, you know, compared to the cases of Egypt or Lebanon or Turkey, call in massive debts and, and, and extract even economic policy changes. Most of the policy reforms or even debates that have happened in Europe have happened internally. And in fact, this year we can see again with the new parliament, there is now a new debate given big decreases in budget revenue, who's going to bear the costs and what can we do with this crisis, right? You know, how can we, how can different parts of the political elite enact economic policies that may or may not benefit either you know, their own constituents or the economy as a whole. So the real question is not, will there be a collapse in a general sense, but who will bear the burden of you know, Iran's you know, Great Depression, uh, part of a global depression, the first time that all of the entire third world is going through a uh, uh, GDP contraction since the end of World War II? Who will bear the burden and you know, who will capitalize on that? And which, which segment of the population will will bear the brunt the most. Those are the questions that I think that we should ask. And um, the, you know, the kind of huge question about collapse is, is, is it's almost impossible to think of scenario. We can look at the previous era uh, of sanctions under Obama and look at the fact that, you know, although it was very messy and it created uh, all kinds of macroeconomic problems down the road, the government was able to use uh, kind of a fiscal pump to direct some credit uh, and some flows to parts of the economy, as Mosin says, that is most connected to it. So the state economy doesn't bear the brunt uh, of these, a uh, 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 major brunt of, of the crisis. And Nadri, I know you want to get in on this. Let me throw another question out. This is an anonymous question about the judiciary's war on corruption. 
Uh, there's a trial of someone named Akbar Tabri, a former executive deputy of the judiciary. Are these real corruption cases or are these, is this more political infighting? I'm, I have my, my cynicism, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I just know, uh, uh, maybe I can talk a little bit about the previous question. And uh, uh, first of all, I want to uh, ask, uh, throw this question back in which country have you seen sanctions resulting in a collapse of the system? I mean, is it, did you find it in uh, Korea, uh, North Korea? Did you have, you, have we seen it in Cuba? Have we seen it in any other place where sanctions have led, led to, uh, to a collapsing regime? In fact, you know, I would say that sanctions in a way keep those regimes in place. Otherwise they would not have been. So um, my question is the other way Around is that you know sanctions are not going to are not going to be effective here. In my view, uh, I don't think that I Iran is going to go through um, a collapse because people are going to wait to see what happens after Khomeini and who is going to come after Khomeini. And I think people are exhausted of uh, of just dealing with so many crises, one crisis at it. I mean, I, one after the other. So therefore, I don't think that people are, have the uh, stamina. They will. They will be protesting. They will be, you know, uh, upset. Uh, upset about a lot of things and unhappy, as as my uh, my my uh, analysis shows. But I think that they're not going to go in. Uh, I don't think that it's it's at that time because they're going to say, well, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens next year. What what happens uh, after Khomeini? Maybe we can still fix the system. So that's uh, that's my view as 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 I see it from here. Yeah. Uh, on the <laughs> judiciary, I think that yeah. if I may, they are we're, we're running low on time, and I want to get all of these these in. Um, this is for Mosin, really, uh, from Amjad Ahmad, who's just uh, joined the Atlantic Council uh, and is going to work on on maximizing human potential in the Middle East. What a novel idea! Um, are there any active foreign investors investing in private companies today? Uh, and if so, what segments are they investing in? Uh, well, welcome Amjad to the team, first of all. Uh, there is no list that anybody maintains about the investors, foreign investors in Iran. I mean, uh, you can be an individual <clears throat> willing to invest in Iran, you can be a company investing in Iran. But today I cannot tell you that there are people or there are companies, foreign companies who are investing in Iran, which are investing in Iran. I'm sure there are. Uh, however, I mean, before the U.S. withdraw and, uh, from the GCPOA and um, reimposing the sanctions, the companies that were investing into the private sector in Iran, they stopped after that to, to continue the investment in Iran. Uh, the sectors were medicine, uh, FMCG, for example, I mean, food, etc. Some of them in the technical companies, petrochemical. I mean, it's, it's a very, very wide. I mean, you know that Iranian economy is very diverse and is very sophisticated. So I cannot say which, which sector. I would guess most of them, as long as you don't get in trouble with the sanctions. I mean, when we invested ourselves in Iran, we invested in FMCG, which means the food and medicine industry. Thank you for that. Um, this is a question uh, as to whether Iran should be held responsible for, uh, for actions that have landed them in this situation. Uh, is, it worth, uh, is the risk worth the reward dealing with a country that, uh, that you know, is, is propping up Hezbollah, that is propping up militias in Iraq, that is uh, destabilizing a, a lot of countries uh, uh, around it. Um, you know, I, I don't know who wants to 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 grab that. And there's a similar question here um, about uh, increasing mistrust of intellectuals. Certainly, the the arrests of dual nationals, the arrests of environmentalists, a crackdown on an NGO uh, called Imam Ali. Uh, you know. Some of these these questions, I, I think, Nadra. Actually, this you get to this in a way in your in your index of happiness because these are the kinds of policies uh, that are interfering. I think with people uh, being able to actually realize their uh, their potential. But um, perhaps I'll let all of you uh, go round one more time. Maybe we'll start in reverse order. And Kevin, also that question about. Uh, 
about the uh, corruption case. Is this is this for real or is it just more uh, factional infighting? So everybody gets a couple of minutes just to to summarize their their final thoughts. Thanks. Okay, well, I think a good example on the kind of corruption battles uh, in Iran is China, because China, you know, had both a kind of inter, uh, you know, internecine warfare in the Chinese Communist Party, and a lot of it took place in the public by the arrest of well-known party officials, uh, in, uh, you know, which was linked to the rise of Xi Jinping. So, uh, yes, I mean, corruption, when everybody in Iran is constantly blaming the other side, the other political corruption, it filters into the public public sphere. People are reading about it in the news. In fact, the rise of what I would think we could call corruption speak or corruption discourse in Iran is the fact that all sides have accused the others of being the most corrupt. It's actually, part of doing politics in Iran today is to blame the other side and call them corrupt. That has produced both internal movements and external movements to hold different officials accountable. But, you know, uh, it is politics. It is politics. It doesn't mean it doesn't have an effect. Okay, just like in China, it had a huge effect. Many party members were arrested in China. Um, what, you know, and but whether it reduces these kind of macro uh, economic processes of state funds going to one segment or another uh, is an open question. Of course, it's very hard to measure that. So corruption politics is real in Iran. And, it, and, it, and the discussion of it has contributed, in my opinion, to the rise of the exhaustion uh, and disillusionment with it. But, you know, it's not the regime versus the people. It is inside of the Iranian government, tons of internecine, you know, politics, and, 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 which is producing, I think, why we see these cases coming out, which are both, you know, in the legal system and, for better or for worse, extra legal. Yeah. Mohsen, final, final thoughts. Uh, and. Uh, and also, on, on, uh, I mean, we've talked about the exchange rate. Um, uh, obviously, sanctions also fosters corruption because it fosters smuggling, right? Yes. Well, <clears throat> when it comes to corruption, I mean, I cannot say better than Kevin did, actually. I have nothing to add to it. I mean, it is good. Um, but of course, corruption is related to the sanctions as well. So I, just to sum it up, I, I used to say that the best gift and the tool that the U.S. government gave to the Iranian government was the sanctions in order to maintain their policies, the geopolitical policies and their, 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 their foothold, you know. Iran could compromise on those geopolitical issues and the corruption, etc., as a side effect of GCPOA. But that is stopped and the U.S. put a very nice gift on the table of the Iranian government, sanctions. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Nadere, the, the last last word is for you. Um. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I fully concur that, uh, you know, in, in a way, much of the intransparency, also corruption uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in dealing, dealing within a group is all uh, to some extent uh, driven by avoiding sanctions, avoiding the traps of, of, of uh, or finding ways of bypassing sanctions. And uh, um, until we uh, can find ways of really being able to directly transact, I think these uh, channels that, that uh, very much uh, uh, promote uh, uh, corruption will, will exist. Having said that, I think uh, even coming back to my uh, to my own uh, uh, analysis, Iran is uh, there are many many countries, including Turkey and and also Vietnam, that actually rank even worse in terms of uh, perceived people's perceived uh, corruption. So I think that uh, corruption is bad, but uh, you know other countries are perhaps even worse. Yeah. Well, I, with that, uh, with that very contextual comment, uh, I think we're going to we're going to draw this to a close. I apologize to to those who uh, didn't get their their questions answered, but uh, you, I I think I know a lot about these topics, and then I listen to people uh, like Kevan and Mosan and Nader, and I learned so much more. So thank you very very much for your your insights, for your blog posts, Kevan. You owe me one. <laughs> And uh, we hope everybody will come back again for our next event. Thank you so much. Stay safe, Thank everyone. Thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you. Guys, that
always great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.